writer Adam Gopnik of The New Yorker shared this story of his four-year-old daughter's imaginary friend. A very concerning story because this was no usual playmate, childhood playmate who shares toys and dutifully takes orders. The childhood playmate with the name of Charlie Ravioli. <laughs> Charlie Ravioli. This childhood imaginary playmate was always too busy to play. The parents would watch their little girl punch a number into her imaginary cell phone and put it to her ear, and they would hear her say, meet me at Starbucks in 25 minutes. <laughs> and then after a few moments, see her crumple. Well, what happened, sweetie? He already had another appointment. <laughs> other times, he canceled lunch again. Still other times, his imaginary secretary, Lori, would answer the imaginary phone, say, he's in a meeting. Charlie Ravioli was always too busy to play. And this is how one four-year-old prepared herself for life in what journalist George Monbiot calls the age of loneliness. Down to the deepest part of her world, her imagination, she reconciled herself to being left out. She prepared herself to miss out on friendship and fun and also being known, being seen, being heard because people are too busy. All the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? For the authors of The Lonely American, Jacqueline Old, MD, and Richard Schwartz, MD, a significant part of the answer is that loneliness emerges ultimately out of a push-pull social dynamic. The push, they say, is the frenetic, overscheduled, hyper-networked intensity of modern life. The pull is the American pantheon of self-reliant heroes who stand apart from the crowd. As a culture, we all romanticize standing apart, and we long to have a destiny in our own hands. But as individuals, each of us hates feeling left out. That's the quote. Now, one reason why we hate it is because the feeling is literally a matter of physical pain in our bodies. Experiments have shown that there's a portion of the brain deep within the cerebral, the frontal cortex, part of a complex alarm system called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Stub your toe and it activates. And, there, and, and that's the source of the pain that you feel. Catch your fingers in a drawer and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex howls. It howls, make this horrible feeling go away. But what's truly amazing is that scientists have shown that the howling also happens when one feels excluded. Experiments were set up that involved no physical harm at all, just feelings of being left out. And it turns out that our brains have evolved in such a way as to want to preserve a sense of belonging to some larger group because over millions of years, it has proven to be crucial to our well-being. So when the feeling of belonging is threatened, you bet an alarm signal is going to go off. And that pain, the pain of loneliness, is the same pain that you get from a physical injury or an illness. We hate feeling left out this much, this much. But the push-pull dynamic has us in its grip. Americans make a virtue out of busyness for reasons of capitalism, and competitiveness, and God helps those who help themselves, Calvinism. Did you know that in 2005, American workers gave back, or didn't take advantage of, 574 million vacation days? Did you know that? Olds and Schwartz say that that is equivalent to more than 20,000 lifetimes. 
They go on to say, surveys done by Gallup and the conference board indicate that Americans who already take fewer vacation days than workers in any other industrialized nation in the world are cutting back even further. And then there's that myth of rugged individualism, standing apart from the crowd, doing it yourself, owning all your own appliances and tools and instruments so you never have to borrow, self-reliance. If we begin to forget, says Olds and Schwartz, we get a regular reminder at least every four years when we see politicians desperately trying to rework their life stories to prevent themselves from that most damning of labels, Washington insider. Yet another reminder is simply the stigma that is put upon loneliness. To admit that you are lonely is to risk being heard as whiny and needy. It is shameful, even though being honest about our loneliness is absolutely the first step towards healing. No wonder Charlie Ravioli is everywhere. We have conflicting wishes. The human heart is ambivalent. Being Charlie Ravioli makes us feel virtuous, and it's our way of enacting self-reliance. But we end up doing exactly the sorts of things that take us into unhappiness, that take us into bitterness, and potentially addictions of all kinds, impaired health, increased aggression, increased rates of crime, decreased lifespans. That is what happens to organisms that are constantly in pain. That's what happens. Being neighborly, it used to mean visiting people. Now, being nice to your neighbors means not bothering them. No wonder it is the age of loneliness. But we can do something about this. We can do something about this. Stop giving all of our life energy to busyness and lone rangerism. Redirect some of that energy so that life becomes more balanced. In our advice to the lonely, say Olds and Schwartz, we often emphasize a time-honored approach. Try to engineer into our life regular contact and shared projects with potentially interesting people. It's the old join a church choir strategy. <laughs> now that's the quote, and I assure you, I'm not making that last part up. They said that, they said that. The only thing I would add is to get involved in religious exploration. Get involved in this beloved community in some way, especially join a covenant group especially join a covenant group. These are groups of six to 10 people or so who meet regularly for the purpose of people being deeply valued and known for fun and fellowship, for learning and connection. UUCA currently has 13 of them and we are starting eight more. We are almost doubling the size of our small group system. We're starting eight more. Now is the time to join. Get in on the ground floor. This is a wonderful thing that you can do. I mean, just look around you. Don't the folks look potentially interesting? <laughs> the folks that are around you? Potentially <laughs> interesting? Yeah. yeah, some of you are like, potentially? Yeah. <laughs> Let's pick up on the rest of that quote. Shared commitments. Shared obligations continue to be the most reliable paths to friendship and sometimes to something more. Now in earlier times, there was no need to engineer social obligations into one's life. It was there waiting, uninvited. People had to take care of another, and social connections followed. Whether it was the burial societies of new immigrant groups who wished to avoid paupers' graves, or the quilting bees of women who merged necessary labor with socializing, a reliable social fabric was very hard to avoid. Olds and Swartz shade that. And, and it's an important perspective for us to keep in mind. We have to be more intentional about it today in this age of loneliness and push-pull, or else we become Charlie Raviolis to each other. 
We just do. It just happens. And there's never any opportunity to play. And it is heart killing. It is heart killing. It is painful in a literal sense. We have got to turn loneliness around. But there's another dimension to that another dimension that current events require us to address. Sometimes loneliness is not so much a matter of being left out as being forced out. You are forced out so often and so completely that the words of Langston Hughes' poem about what happens to a dream deferred come true. You dry up like a raisin in the sun. You fester like a sore and then run. You stink like rotten meat. You crust and sugar over. You just sag or you explode. In this regard, today's reading comes to mind about a person of color coping in a space that is white dominated, having to put on a mask. Instead of talking black, says Camille Jackson, I speak the Queen's English. I don't drop verb endings. I speak slowly, enunciate. I am extra clear. I don't use the full range of facial expressions black folks rely on for meaning because my white coworkers won't get it. I surprise myself by how well I wear it. Without it, I would have been fired many times over. I'm resentful. It hides my frustration at fearing that my white bosses think I never work hard or long enough. Now we all know the loneliness of feeling like you have to wear a mask. Everyone in this room wears at least one mask, probably a bunch of them. We can name them. But the degree of loneliness is intensified astronomically when racism is at play, when you know when you know that you are not being seen as an individual, but as a represent, representative of an entire race. And all the stereotypes are at play. And it's a thing if you don't fit that stereotype. It's a thing if you do fit that stereotype. And you can never win. You can never win. This is not about Charlie Ravioli. This is about drying up like a raisin in the sun or festering, or sagging, because you get so damn tired. Or it's about exploding. <coughs> the feeling forced out kind of loneliness, it leads to that too. Philosopher Hannah Arendt puts her finger on it precisely. In her book, The Life of the Mind, she writes that profound loneliness, which she defines as the experience of being abandoned by everyone, including one's own self, hardens a person, makes them shut down, and they can't receive any new information. They can't think rationally, so that finally they are in the clutches of some tightly wound ideology, and they are willing to commit acts of terrorism in the name of that ideology, the profound loneliness of African Americans these days, to see video after video of young black men doing nothing, gunned down by police. Around three weeks ago, the death of Alton Sterling, who was the 184th person, black person, killed by police just this year, the death of Philando Castile, number 185. And then on July 7, more deaths. Five police officers killed in Dallas by Micah Johnson, an ex-military African-American. The Dallas police chief, David O. Brown, said he was upset about Black Lives Matter and about, and about the recent police shootings and was upset at white people and he wanted to kill white people, especially white officers. Soon afterwards, ex-New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani went on the offensive and said the cause was the whole Black Lives Matter movement, which is ridiculous. It is 
a red herring if I ever saw one, divisive. We need to talk about what happens to a dream deferred instead, deferred and deferred and deferred until the resulting anguish, loneliness, leads to explosions. Says New York Times writer Charles Blow, since people have camera phones, we are actually seeing these deaths live and in living color. Now, a terrorist with a, with a racist worldview has taken it upon himself to co-opt a cause and mow down innocent officers. This is a time when communities, institutions, movements, and even nations are tested. Will people of moral clarity good character and righteousness, righteous cause, be able to drown out the chorus of voices that seek to use each dead body as a societal wedge? Will the people who see both the protests over police killings and the killings of police officers as fundamentally about the value of life rise above those who see political opportunity in this arms race of atrocities? These are very serious questions, he goes on, soul of a nation questions that we dare not ignore. Charles Blow is right. We dare not ignore them. This is a time of testing. Soul of a nation questions. And we are people, we who aspire to be of moral clarity, good character, and righteous cause. The feeling forced out kind of loneliness, we have got to turn that around. And how it happens is through intentional and strategic acts of love and justice. That's how you heal that kind of loneliness. It happens by engineering into our lives shared projects that dismantle them, dismantle poverty, dismantle racism, dismantle divisiveness, reject violence. Don't let hate motivate. Don't feed the fears. Don't build a wall. Build the opposite of a wall. No one left out. That is what we Unitarian Universalists believe. No one forced out of their fair share, their just due, what they deserve simply by virtue of being human. No one experiencing that profoundest kind of loneliness which causes a dream to dry up or fester or stink or crust or sugar over or sag or explode. No one left out. Amen. <laughs>